Statistics plays an important role in genetics. For instance, statistics prove that the number of offspring is an inherited trait. If your parents didn't have any offspring, then you probably won't either. Think about it. All right, so let's go ahead and we're going to revisit the p-value. The p-value represents the probability that we could see the results we saw if the null h0 is true, the null hypothesis. So why do we reject the null hypothesis when the p-value is below our alpha? Well, that means if the p-value is low, it's highly unlikely. For example, when I was on that trial and the guy who had bought the zip ties and duct tape, if he were, if what we assumed was true, the probability he just coincidentally bought the zip ties and duct tape two hours before the kidnapping is really low. It captures our attention. It's highly unlikely we would see that if he was innocent. So we say, oh, that's too big a long shot. That means we probably have sufficient evidence that the other option is true, that he is guilty. All right. Now, if I had instead said, oh, he was wearing a blue shirt and the person involved in the crime was wearing a blue shirt, is that probability really low? No, it's actually pretty high. So it's highly likely to see people in blue shirts and that doesn't make us change our mind. We have insufficient evidence to change our mind. Let's go ahead and look at an example. We have a pharmaceutical company calibrates its manufacturing process. So the mean atorvastatin content in a pill is 40 milligrams. That's a cholesterol medication. And the population standard deviation is 0.5 milligrams. Data from a random sample of 10 tablets gets a mean dosage level of 39.7 milligrams of atorvastatin. They test the idea that the sample is different than the specified level of 40 milligrams and get a p-value of 0.058. What are our null and alternate hypotheses? Well, our null hypothesis is that the machine is, we should assume the machine is working. There's no reason to assume that it's not. Our alternate is, oh, it's not really giving us 40 milligrams. So I've already calculated the p-value for you. Since it's different, this is what's called a two-sided, uh, two-tailed test. And the probability, don't worry about how I got it, the p-value is 0.058. The main thing is we need to be able to compare this probability and say, is this a low probability? And the general rule we have is that a probability is low if it's less than 0 0.050. Is this lower than 0 0.050? No, it's not. So it's not that unusual. I'm not going to change my mind from the assumption that the machine is working. All right. So high probability is not impressive. We don't change our mind from the null to the alternate. So we say there's insufficient evidence that the machine is manufacturing dosages different from the 40 milligrams of the torvastatin. Now let's do a test to see if it's lower than 40 milligrams. And first of all, our null and our alternate are 40 and less than 40. So this is a little different. We're we got 0 0.029. So because our p-value of 0 0.029 is less than 0 0.05, that is a low probability. It's less than 5%. So we change our mind. We reject the assumption of H0 that the mean is 40 milligrams. And we say there is sufficient evidence for the alternate, which is less than 40 milligrams. All right, so here are the steps to test a hypothesis um, using p-values. We use the alternate hypothesis to calculate the p-value, which means we're either doing a left tail test, a right tail test, or a two tail test. We calculate the test statistic z um, if doing the p-value by hand. So we may or may not need z. Um, and we can use it to determine the probability. Then we can use a C to calculate the p-value using a formula like normal CDF, or we can do a calculator shortcut, and yes, I will show you that shortly. Then we can compare this probability to the significance level, which is alpha. If alpha is not given, use alpha as 0 0.05. And then we're going to reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis H0. We reject if the p-value is lower because very low probability is like, oh, that's unusual. Maybe I should change my mind. If it's higher, like, eh, 
That could have happened anyways. So we're not so impressed. And then if it's low, we determine there is sufficient evidence for the alternate. If it's not low, if it's higher, then there's insufficient evidence. And it's always about the alternate hypothesis. Evidence is only for the alternate, not for your null. We don't gather evidence that people are innocent. We try to gather evidence to show people are guilty. We assume they're innocent, which is why we're trying to see if it's worth it to change our mind or not, if we have sufficient evidence. All right. Now let's look at this example. We have uh, X is a random variable representing different blood sugar lead, uh, readings. For healthy adults, the normal levels of blood sugar when fasting is 80 to 99 milligrams per deciliter. The population standard deviation is 3 milligrams per deciliter. So I gave you sigma here. Here are seven blood te sugar tests for Amy over the course of a week. Use your calculator to determine the sample mean. So you can put these in a list like list 1, 104, 110, 82, 95, 109, 110, and 102. And if you do that and do one var stats, a calculator will give you the mean here and also the sample standard deviation. Now, using alpha as 0.05, we're going to test the data and see if it indicates that Amy's blood sugars are higher than the normal range. So first of all, what is the significance level? It is whatever alpha is. So it's 0.05. What are the null? Well, the null is that her blood sugar is normal. We'll say it's 99. The alternate is that it's higher than 99. In this case, are we going to use a left-tailed, a right-tailed, or a two-tailed? Left-tailed would be if we're looking at this area. Right-tailed would be this area. Two-tailed is both. Well, we were looking at the mean being greater than 99, so that's on the right. So it's a right tail test. So what sampling distribution will we use? We're going to use a normal distribution since we know sigma, and it's for an average. So it's very important. If you know the population standard deviation, that means you're using the normal distribution. Now, what is the value for our test statistic? Our formula is z equals x bar from our sample minus mu over sigma for our average. Now, since we're doing an average of 7, I'm going to take my old standard deviation of 3 and divide it by the square root of the sample size, which is 7. And I get 1.134. Remember, for averages, our standard, our spread, our standard deviation is going to tighten up. So that number will now be smaller than our original number of 3. Now I'm going to substitute in for z, 101.71 minus 99, and divided by 1.134, and I get 2.39. So what is the p-value? It's a probability z is greater than 2.39, which is normal CDF of 2.39 to 1,000. Don't need that twice, but okay. And I get 0 0.0083. Is that a low probability? It's a very low probability. This seems a little high on average. In fact, we can argue that the probability over here is 0 0.008. So since it is so low, we reject the null hypothesis. They, we say there's sufficient evidence for the alternative hypothesis that her blood sugar is above the normal range. Now, how to do this on your calculator. So nice thing is your calculator will do most of the work for you. First, you, if you're doing data, now this is from a list of data. Enter the data in the list, usually list one, by pressing stat, then edit. Then press stat and scroll over to test to get to the test menu. Select this first one. In this unit, we're only going over three tests. Number one, number two here, which is a t-test, and also number five, which is a one prop z test. So these are the three tests we're going to be talking about. Make sure that once you pick one Z test, which is what we're doing today, make sure data is highlighted and press enter. For your mean, you're not going to put the sample mean. You're going to put in the hypothesized value. And we were comparing to 99. For sigma, you have, uh, put in the population standard deviation. Now, if you don't have sigma, this value right here, then you're not doing the right test. You probably need to do a T test if you don't have a sigma. All right. So S won't work, which is the standard error for a sample. We need sigma for a population standard deviation. For data, enter the list, which is usually L1. To change a list, you can always press second, stat, and list to change it. 
Now, frequency should always be one unless you actually happen to have a frequency list, which we rarely do. For the mean, choose the one that matches the alternate alternative hypothesis. See how we have doesn't equal the mean, the hypothesized value is less than the hypothesized value or is greater than the hypothesized value. So here I have the data from our previous example. And then I scroll down and I, you can't see it here, but you see calculate and press enter. And then your output's going to look like this. Your top line is your basically your alternate hypothesis. Z is the test statistic. P is the p-value. Very handy. It starts with a p, so that should be easy to remember. X bar is your mean from your sample. S of X is the standard error from your sample, your list of data. And N is the sample size. So this is how you run a z-test for a, a list of data. But I can also run a z-test for statistics when I don't have a list of data, but I give you the measurements. So how do we do that? We're going to press stat and test just like we did before. We're still going to one Z test up here. We're instead of doing data, we're going to make sure that stats is highlighted and we'll press enter there. For the mean, uh, mu naught, that's still the hypothesized value. Sigma is still the standard deviation for the population, not S. And for X bar, go ahead and give the mean whatever they give you not the hypothesized value. So it's not 99, it's what you got from your sample. For mu here, they're trying to figure out what your alternate hypothesis is. So pick the one that matches your alternative and then scroll to calculate and press enter to get your output. Okay, if you don't have access to a calculator, you can also use a GeoGebra applet. And there's also a staplet that I will show on, a, but it won't do a Z test. So GeoGebra is your only option if you're trying to do a Z test. So, okay, so going to the applet, you're gonna have a couple options on the drop down. You wanna make sure you're picking Z test for a mean. If you went to the staplet, you would, wouldn't see it there and you'd be very disappointed. Um, then we need to put in our null hypothesis, which is your hypothesized value for mu or your mean. In this case, it's 99. Then you select what form the alternate hypothesis it is. So you can remember there are three different forms here. Pick one of those by clicking on the circle right there, and then you're going to put in the mean from your sample. See, it says sample mean right there. Now, the only thing I don't like is it's sample here, and then it shows sigma. But sigma is not for the sample, it's for the population. And again, this is a very unusual case where you have the population standard deviation that you can put in. Finally, for the sample, go ahead and put in the sample size, which is n. And you will see it'll uh, crank out these results for you. The last number is the p-value right there. But it also provides the test statistic z, so you can go ahead and report that.